Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 140, Fred Van Vliet. We are here at the, I believe it's called the OVO Athletic Center. Yep. Is that right? I don't yep. know all my Drake lingo. But. Yep. The owl's on the wall, so you know there's some <laughs> OVO connection. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were here in Toronto, uh, actually, uh, at the practice facility for the Raptors. Uh, Fred just spent an hour with us. After practice, we had a lovely chat. Uh, Fred, by the way, episode 25, uh, two two years ago, still one of my favorite episodes we've done. And I think this one's way better. It's just a great, great podcast guest. Some, we, like, every player is good. Every player is an interesting story. He's a, Fred is a... He, he knows how to be on a podcast. And he doesn't do very many of them. And for whatever reason, he's, he's now graced us with his presence twice. And... Uh, this is really fun. We really get into everything. We do get into everything, including Donovan Mitchell's performance last night. 71 points, first player ever with 70 points and over 10 assists in a game. Second most total total points, uh, 99 points he was uh, accounted for when you count points and assists. That's second all-time to Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game. Wilt, by the way, this is what's shocking to me. He dropped 100. He only had two assists. He only had two assists in this game. He only <laughs> that is crazy. So, so I didn't even realize so, that until I so saw that Donovan, stat this morning. So Donovan wasn't that far off from, from having the, mo- the most, creating the most yes. points ever in an NBA. If it had gone that's to, how iconic if it had gone the to performance. Double, if it had was gone to double night. overtime, he probably would have done it. I don't even know. It, this is we spend the first thirty minutes of this conversation with Fred talking about this. Like, yeah, what is happening in the NBA right now? Luca going crazy. Braun at thirty-eight, back-to-back forty balls. Uh, Clay Thompson had 54 last night. Joel Embiid had the most casual 42 and 13 game ever against a really good team in the New Orleans Pelicans. Yeah. Uh, the the level of high performance right now amongst NBA players is insane. And I, Donovan Mitchell, by the way, uh, he his performance I probably think probably takes the cake. It's one of the greatest games of all time. Where do you think? he ranks in terms of being a real MVP candidate. I, I mean, he has to be in the conversation. Oh, yeah. he has he's to be in the conversation. He has to be in the conversation. He's in the conversation. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, you know, we have the odds, the DraftKings odds in front of us right now. I don't know necessarily that he is in the top five just because of how stacked the top five is. I mean, the other guy who's in this conversation besides... Luca, I'd, say, I'd say the top seven are stacked. Stacked. And we talked, stacked. To, but the other guy that we we have to talk about, we talked about a lot on um, on Monday's episode is KD, and how he just is. I mean, these guys are these guys are not losing. I know, and it so much of uh, the MVP conversation is centered around how a team is playing, and because Luca carries such a Uh, high usage rate and is required to do so much creation. And on DraftKings Sportsbook, he's hovered at or near the top of the MVP odds since they opened. He he started with the second, or he tied for the best odds with Joel Embiid since the MVP odds opened back in May for this season. Uh, He's currently number one. KD has moved now into the top five. Tatum is second. Jokic third. Giannis fourth. Kevin Durant having an all-time season fifth, Joel Embiid sixth, John Morant seventh, then Donovan Mitchell, and then Zion and Steph. Both of those guys are hurt. Zion got hurt last night after having 26 on 10 of 12 shooting. Like what? This is just, it's incredible. It's and Donovan, incredible. so Donovan started the season at plus 8,000. Yep. Now he's up to, now he's up to plus 2,800. I wanted to say before uh, we get back to top five in Raptor right now. Yes. Joker. Luca, KD, Donovan is now joined the conversation. You looked Anthony, it up this morning. Anthony Davis is still fifth. Yep. Um, but Donovan was not in the conversation before last night in, in the top five, and now he is. I have a question for you about this. I just want to acknowledge something, Tommy. I'm so proud of you. I, you I look, told at, it every, me when you, I look we, at it every day. We started podcasting in 2020, January 2020. So it's been three years of podcasting together this month. 
And if you had told me three years ago that, that I you'd was be, be citing a, Raptor, Raptor every single episode. every and you single, do it all the time every now. single day, you're I very comfortable. A, you realize you understand what defensive rating and offense. I think it's it, like I, I'm so proud I, of you. Man. I think that it, awesome. I think that it is helpful. I think that everyone who watches and listens to the show should pay attention to it. I have a question about a guy on this list. Yeah. Um, who I think is being undervalued a little bit, even though he is in the in the top six right now, and that's Joel. Yeah. Is that he's he's somebody they are eight and two in their last ten. We've yes. talked about them. We talked about them last week about uh, you know, since they've gotten healthy and they're not fully healthy, Maxie's not back yet, but since they've gotten healthy, uh, how this is a you know, a unit of a team and we kind of don't know what their ceiling is. W- not to say that he should be the front runner right now because we've talked about these other guys, but is this somebody that still feels undervalued in this conversation because he's having another incredible season? I mean, it's well, it depends it's, on how you look at betting, Tommy. Yeah, because I would say that's a good value if you wanted to bet and you thought the Philadelphia 76ers were capable of being a top two seed in the East and Joel was going to continue this play because he's a plus 1100 right now. Luca on the other side is the as the front runner is at a plus 260. It's all on DraftKings. You know, we we talk about this with Fred and we we uh you, you guys will hear that conversation in a second. You know, I think so much of MVP should be tied to winning. Jokic uh last year uh Westbrook uh when he won in OKC, both of those teams were sixth place. But generally speaking, you you need to be in that sort of top two to three range. And if one team clearly pulls away, as was the case in let's say 2015, uh, with the Warriors, um, you know, Steph's numbers weren't crazy like they are now or weren't crazy like they were in 2016 when he won his second one. Um, I, I think that there's a case. The problem with this year, there's so many guys putting up insane numbers. So I think a lot of, as we get down to the end, a lot of these odds will shift a lot yeah. because teams, there's so much parity and, and teams are going to go on winning streaks, losing streaks, whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, for for... I mean, do I think Donovan Mitchell has a real chance? Probably not. Joel has a real chance. Kevin Durant has a real chance. I think John Moran has a real chance. If it weren't for injuries, Zion and Steph would have real chances. Um, and then and then the other guys, you know, Luka, Jokic, Giannis, Tatum, Durant, like they're, they're front runners for sure. Do you think do you think voters are affected at all by specific high profile flashy moments so like lucas 60 not just not just the 60 21 and 10 but how they won that game is that the kind of thing that will be seared in their brain or they're just more looking at the overall landscape of the numbers um it's a good question tommy i i think because there's 82 games and not 12 it doesn't I remember growing up and always hearing about uh, the Heisman and like having a Heisman moment. Yeah, you know, a big game, like a four hundred yard week nine, whatever. Yeah, 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 whatever. Maybe like I don't think they're necessarily swayed by that. I will say that I think that's where Joel, that's what Joel didn't necessarily have last year was like multiple MVP moments late in the season because it was so close last year. Yeah. Um, and and there's already been so many early. MVP moments from all these guys. Yeah, I think that's the problem is it keeps happening. Yes. Like Joel's already had like three of them this year and then he just it just keeps getting one up. Yeah. So we don't know what we don't know what you know the next three weeks are gonna look like. Um and we get into the why of why these keep moments keep happening uh with our guest this week, Fred Van Vliet. When I throw down on the NBA action, it's gotta be with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Take a shot at an even bigger payout with DraftKings Friday Night Favorites. All you have to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app using code JJ, opt in, and place a two-leg pregame Moneyline Parlay, and you'll get a 50% profit boost only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Let's get to Toronto Raptor All-Star, Red Van Fleet. All right, let's welcome in Fred. Uh, Fred, the last time we had you on the show, episode 25, I looked yeah, it up yeah. this morning, early November 2020, pre-free agency, pre-you re-signing with the Raptors, and honestly, you've probably hit another level in your career since that show, so a lot to catch up on. We appreciate you joining us, man. Man, thanks for having me. You guys are in a different space, too, since then, so <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> hey, that's really nice of you. I actually... I want to start with whatever the hell is going on in the NBA right now. Yeah. Because it seems night to night that 
something historical is happening. So we're recording this on Tuesday. Last night, Donovan Mitchell had 71. First player with uh, a 70 points and 10 assists in a game. Scored or assist on 99 points. That's second all time to Wilt. We've seen Luke on a tear. The first 60 point, 60, 20, 10 game in <laughs> NBA history. There's been three times, I think, that in the last like four weeks that five guys have gone for 40 or more. Yeah. Um, what do you make of all this, all, all this, all these incredible performances right now? I mean, it's it's incredible to watch. You know, just as a fan of the game, I think um, we're in a transition period. I'm gonna use that word a lot today, but I think that uh, just you know that old guard of the greats that have dominated the last 15, 10, 20 years. You know, the LeBrons, the KDs, the Stephs. Those guys are still playing at an incredibly high level, but we also have a whole new wave of new guys that are stepping up and and putting numbers on the board. And also the game is changing too. Like the NBA is behind a lot of this as well, you know, just with the rule changes and um, trying to appease, you know, the fan base and, and make it more watchable. So, I mean, I'm, you know, league pass every night, 140, 130, you know, 150, somebody had the other day. Uh, I think the game is just changing really fast and, um, you know, it's, it's fun to watch. Take up, take Pascal at MSG out of it because it's sort of an obvious one. Is there yeah. another one of these recent sort of crazy games that you just watch as a fan and you just kind of shook your head at? All of Lucas are are crazy. Uh, I can't believe nobody's double him. I mean, like, if you don't double him, it's 50. You know, it's, like, guaranteed. If you don't double him, it's... I mean, I think his last five is, like, 50, 50, 40, 37, and it's all triple doubles. So it's, like, those I, I'm scratching my head watching them, watching the team play single coverage the whole night. Um Donovan Mitchell's last night was, you know, obviously incredible. Uh, but yeah, those those ones when it's like you need every play, you need every bucket is down to the wire, it's overtime. Like those are the ones that, you know, you're you're locked into. And just the shot making in this league is, you know, at an all time high. Luca has been blitzed or double teamed more than any other player. Yeah. Um, I think in pick and roll, Devin Booker, I don't know the numbers now, but until Devin Booker right. got hurt, he was second. And Giannis, I think, has faced the most double team or the second most double teams um you guys by the way speaking of blitzing luca yeah. <laughs> are are one of two teams this year to blitz him 15 or more times in a game yeah which no I, no other player has been blitzed 15 or more times in a game this right. year and i i do think like last night i was watching the houston game going into that game they'd already played twice houston in two games had blitzed him three times in pick and roll i think some of this is this is going to sound a little weird coming from me because I'm such an analytics guy. But some of this is teams looking at the analytics and saying, all right, when we do this coverage, our points per possession is this. When we do this coverage, no it's this. So let's go with this. Right. But against great players, to me, you have to constantly mix up what the coverage is. Absolutely. Or, to your point, blitz the fuck out of them yeah. and just make someone else beat you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think any of these guys you can give a steady diet of one thing, no matter what it is, whether it's doubling or not. I think at some point in the night, they should see a double or another guy or three guys just to change the rhythm. And, you know, uh, we were watching it. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the old days where you would just, you know, show up and it would say, okay, we got Kobe tonight, you know, just make it hard on them and don't let nobody else score. That's kind of what is, is going on now is like let one guy go off and then try to stay home on everybody else. So some teams have that philosophy. Obviously, that's not one of ours. We're probably a little drastic on the other end where, you know, we might double you on a jump ball uh, to start <laughs> the game. So uh, we, we try a lot of different things. I think it, um you know, it keeps you Honest, it keeps you guessing, but um, it's hard to make some of these guys uncomfortable. You got to be creative. I want to, I want to, in a second, I want to go back to what you're talking about in terms of the why, why we're seeing this level of scoring. Um, but I want to go back first to something you just talked about, and that's sort of this era that we're in with the talent level, because I, I have a hard time. Like, I think that the, the talent top to bottom is as good as it's ever been. I think the talent at the top is as good as it's ever been. Certainly, there are great players from the 2000s or the 90s or the 80s, 70s, 60s, go down the list, that would be great in today's era. But I think at the top, it's as good as it's ever been. And part of the reason 
is because of the guys you mentioned. Steph's still playing at a high level. LeBron's still playing. KD, these guys are all timers, mm -hmm. right? Then you have guys like Giannis and Embiid and Jokic who are in their mid-20s sort of just entering their prime, playing at MVP levels. And then you have just an insane mixture of young guys, Ja, Zion, Tatum, Luka, you go down the list. Yep. And it, it, like I would argue in 15, 20 years, there's going to be a nostalgia for this era, era where we look back and say, oh, that was maybe the golden era of the NBA. Yeah, no doubt. I think it's just the perfect mix. You know what I mean? It's like you got the all-timers that are still in their prime with the way that people take care of their bodies now. And you see the, the what would be considered old at 38 and 37 and 36 in the NBA is like they're getting better which is, you know, crazy to see. And then you got, you know, the, the wave of the new guys. So it's a good mix of everything. And the game is just changing and the pace is changing the way it's played. And it's so up and down now. And I think, you know, with the adding two roster spots and having more development guys. So it's, you know, uh, older, you know, guys that are done might look and say it may be watered down, you know what I mean? Just because of how even it seems on a nightly basis. But, um, you know, I think that adds more value in terms of just having more guys that can get it done every night. Like every night there's probably three to five guys, six guys on a court who can just dominate a game on both teams, you know, on any given night. And, um, you know, it's, it's incredible to, to be a part of. And you think that contributes to just the level of parity in both conferences? I mean, we were talking about the West earlier today. It's just like, who's the front runner there? You know, yeah. it's like every night it's just someone different. Yeah, I think, uh, listen, you got to pay attention. It's like people forget that it's a business too, you know what I mean? As much as it's a sport and we're diehard athletes that just live and breathe and, you know, bleed this this game, I think that um, the schedule changed this year. Like having, you know, playing the same team back-to-back -back and then, you know, four-day four, four day stretch, three-day stretch, that changes things. Um, it's just more spread out, I think. This next CBA will be interesting. There's a lot of things going on that that are attributing to some uh, something different that we know is different. You can feel it. You can watch it and see that the game is changing. We'll see. The playoffs are going to be interesting this year. I had a question for you. I'm curious your perspective on this too because you've had a bunch of games like this. But I was rewatching your the game last year you, where you hit 11 threes and you had 54 points, which is a uh, team record. Very you know different than what Donovan did last night, but like. When you're in a zone like that, do you understand what's going on, or you just look up at the scoreboard in the fourth quarter and you're like, "Oh shit, I just I have nine threes, I have ten threes, or whatever it is," or it's like you you can tell right away this feels like a special night. Yeah, I, I mean, I knew on my first shot, but um, again, I, I think I had like 27 in the first half, and then I'm like, "All right, let's let's go for it," you know what I mean, and come out in the third and be aggressive, but. Again, I have a theory that you need help to score 50 in the NBA. You know what I'm saying? And 40 is like 30 now, which is getting crazy with the free throws. And guess you, I mean, Donovan had 25 free throw attempts last night, which is insane. But um, the other teams got to help you a little bit. So I was scorching hot on my night. And um, they were still going under late in the second half and like blowing switches and things like that. So you need a little help. But uh, I, I felt it, you know, pretty early in the, in the game. Do you uh are you able to count your stats? Do you do that? I feel like most players do that. Yeah, I got in a their good brain, feel. Like during yeah. the during the game. Yeah, I got a good feel of where I'm at, you know what I'm saying, good or bad. And um it's good. You know what I mean? Like you might look up every arena is different. Some arenas got the box score that's true to the T, like that's on the true. screen. Yeah. So it's like hard, it's hard not to it's hard to miss. But if I miss like three threes in a row and I feel like I'm I'm two for 15 and I look up, you know, I might only be three for six. It's like, all right, I got like five more attempts to go. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I never, I, I, I could, I was, too much was going on to be able to count like what yeah, I was from like, the field. Yeah. But in terms of like the counting, you know, points, rebounds, assists. Yeah. I was always pretty tuned in. There were times though, like to his question about being in that flow state, there were times where you really got it going in a short stretch mm -hmm. and you'd be like god how many fucking points do i yeah. have do i and you look up and you're like oh shit i got 23 right now i just had i just had nine in like two right. minutes no and it, it could happen fast yeah. especially with the threes you know what i mean you're a couple of possessions away or 90 seconds away from like a 10 point swing you know I, I had a game this year where i had five free throws in one possession you know what i mean i got fouled on a three two techs and I think it was a side out. So it was like, you know what I mean? You have a seven-point possession, and it could change your whole night. So I just try to compete in the moment. You know, it's there. Uh, but 
I'm not like a check the box score on the bench guy. I've seen that. Yeah, some. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, t- I've seen that some in the, in the league in my seven years. Uh, guys is sneaking down looking at the box score. They want to know their plus minus yeah. mid game <laughs> in the first quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're it's checking like, it. Come on, wait a little bit on that. Yeah, um, you've provided you provided some some theories and reasons already why the offense is so good in the NBA right now and the defenses are are struggling to catch up. Um, the pace, uh, skill level, of course, schedule changes. I actually wanted to provide just a little bit of perspective on this, actually, because my I'll go to my first year in the league. The number one offense was the Phoenix Suns at 112.9 points per 100 possessions. That'd be 16th this year. <laughs> uh, the 30th ranked defense, so the worst defense in the league was the Memphis Grizzlies. They would be eighth this year. Mm. Your first year in the league, the number one offense in the league was the Golden State Warriors, one of the yep. greatest teams ever, ever in NBA history. No doubt. They would only be eighth in offense yeah. this year. <laughs> and the 30th uh, defense in the league uh, that year, which that was <clears throat> those Lakers teams that weren't very good, um, they would actually be 11th wow. in the league this year wow. defensively. And I, I would like to ask you because you're in it. I, I'm yeah. two years out of it, right. and I, I so I, I watch games and I look at the numbers and yeah. I talk to people around the league. But from a player who is actively doing it, you're on the court. Yeah, is it the spacing? Is it skill level? Is it the is it the rule changes? The referees? Like yeah. what is contributing to this? I think it's a little bit of everything, but I think what I've seen, especially like in the last three years, was that. I think, and I'm going to give ourselves a lot of credit here because I think we won a championship that was like outside of the natural flow of the NBA. You know, you got a disgruntled star that comes to a market that is not really uh, in the NBA's plans of where they see things. And we win a chip. You got Nick, who was probably the most unconventional coach that we have in the NBA. And I think that it opened people's eyes. It's such a copycat league that some of that, creativeness got trickled down throughout the NBA. And I think that a lot of people are looking night to night and and game to game. There's, there's a lot of adjustments. Whereas when I first came in seven years ago, it was like, we're a blue team. We're going to down you on the sides. We're going to play drop all year long. And then maybe we'll make adjustments in the playoffs. Whereas like you're seeing more adjustments and more creativity on a night to night basis than ever before. And I think the game is if it's going up, if the game is going to continue to grow, you know, it's just natural that there's going to be more adjustments and more people trying to find ways to be successful. And, and you're seeing that like now the Mavericks have an adjustment for when you just want to double Luca the whole game. You know, they practice. They've been practicing it for two or three years, so they're going to be better at it. That's just one example. Yeah, I, I think some of it, too. I, I think the analytics have played a role, of course, in the sense of the value of shots, mm-hmm. historically the value of a corner three versus a contested mid-range, mid-range shooter from a non-elite yep. mid-range guy like Kevin Durant, right? We can we can say all that, and an offense can say, all right, we we want to play this way. Um, but I, I remember my first year in Philly, that was the first time, so this was like, shit, man, my 12th year yeah. was the first time where I'm on the bench and they're talking about lineup data mid game. Yeah. They're going over that. And like, so game to game, they're like, well, you had a three game stretch where you played seven minutes with Amir Johnson and you guys are a negative two (laughs) rating. So we're going to, we're not going to put you guys together. And it's like that manipulation. And I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that in a negative way at all. Um, I, I think it's like teams are now optimizing the best lineups as much as they possibly can at all times. No, one one hundred percent, and we're in that era. You know, we're in the peak of the analytics era. Like, there's new stats and new things every day and um, every week. And like you said, it's it, all everybody has access to it. It's not like it used to be where there was an office where there was a couple of analytics guys in there doing all the numbers. It's like no, now you might have a coach who was came from that office that's on the bench that's got an iPad during the game or whatever the case may be. Like, it's a big part of the league and. I think the game is is kind of adjusting to that. And the players have more access to it too. You know yeah. what I mean? Like when I first came in, it was the beginning of like, don't take twos if you're a role player. Um, and now you got to change your whole game based around that. So you got a whole league of guys that 
are used to that now. And right. The the le- the the strategy and and the analytics have sort of molded players into yeah. the optimal version of whatever analytics right. says. You got to just yeah. keep adjusting and adapting. Yeah. I think the one thing the analytics is definitely doing is changing the numbers that we're seeing, which is you know like we talked about in the beginning, which is the high numbers and just the shooting percentages. It's the optimization. It's the optimization. Of yeah, I don't know sure. how much it whether you like it or not as far as like aesthetics yeah, from right. a hooping standpoint of like just good hoop and good basketball but um numbers for sure is changing it i talk about this all the time uh with you know different people in the league and i i've said it on air before uh during a game uh the the hardest actions to guard right now in the nba what do you think they are besides obviously like Giannis head of steam and transition yeah. i'm not talking about that but yeah but, Actions that teams are running, what are the hardest ones? I to think run? everybody's running to Spain, the pick and roll, you know what I mean? The 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 high mid with the back screen. Um and and uh, not just Giannis, but the throw ahead is is killer right now. Just just a defensive rebound throw ahead and just play. And you know, if you get in a guy's way, it's a foul. If you touch him, it's a foul. And like you gotta be able to keep up that pace. So that's two things that we're struggling with right now for sure. <laughs> so that's just speaking from experience, is like the throw ahead and getting back and trying to get your defense set up. Um and guarding guarding the foul line, man. It's it's a it's a struggle for everybody and including the officials. So it's like it's a dance every night to try to figure out, you know, how the game's gonna be called. I was at the Knicks game yesterday and Tom Thibodeau is not known as necessarily the most creative offensive yeah. <laughs> coach. But I took my yeah. two boys, it was an early game, so I took them both to the game. And at some point in the second half, they come out uh in an ATO and I'm like, are they running flex? They ran flex to get to Spain action. Yeah. And I was like, the Mavs and Suns, I think, were the first two teams that really disguised getting mm-hmm. into Spain action. Right. We would run it on certain teams I played in. Like it was so obvious. Right. I would start right. underneath you the basket. Start there, like yeah. obviously I'm gonna call go it sit. stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stack. Call it yeah. stack. Yeah. Now teams are disguising it so well. I'm yeah. like, yo, if the Knicks and Thibodeau are running flex into Spain, like it's this it's 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 hard, man. Yeah, it's hard. The- I'll throw one other I'll throw one other action. And that is the the post splits with Steph. Post split, yeah. The post splits I mean, with Steph. Yeah. And I because I guarded that. Yeah, yeah. And that to me was fucking impossible. Yeah. And now it's now it's Clay and Jordan Poole with Draymond and Looney that's been doing it forever. So it's even harder, you know, to do it uh to guard those guys. They do it the best for sure. Boston's got a couple of things that's hard to guard with with the the personnel that they have. Um but the pace and the the execution, like when when it's rolling, it's hard to get it control of some of these teams for sure. In in retrospect, looking back at the nineteen defense in particular, were there things that stood out to you? You know, thinking about it now, that kind of contributed to your guys' level of success just on that side of the floor. Yeah, I just think it was just all timers. Like when you really look at it, you know what I mean, and not in the sense of like the greatest of all time players, but like Marcus Saul, Serge Ibaka, Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green. Kyle Lowry, let's just stop there, right? Then yeah. Pascal, myself, Norman Powell. So it was like, it was just such a high level of detail and focusing and just like, you know, there's things that you have to talk about and then there's things that you do without thinking. And when all five guys can do it without necessarily like having a conversate about it every possession or like, I don't have to wonder where you're going. I don't have to wonder where... JJ's going, I just know you're going to be there. That's kind of what we got to towards the end of the year. And I think that was the biggest key. You got great individual and team defenders, and you just put them together with some creativeness from the coaching staff. It was a, it was a great mix, for sure. I'll say this, having played against that team, um, basketball is actually a pretty simple game. Can you beat your guy and draw a second defender and make a play from there? Yeah. If it's a two-man action, can you bring a third defender in the action? What you guys did, I know because you blitzed every Joel Embiid handoff I had in that yep. seven-game series yep. <laughs> with fucking Mark, who yep. I can't see over, yep. or Serge. But what you guys did is you would say, fuck it. Like, we're going to put a second defender in a help position at the nail. Yeah, We're going we're gonna to bring a third guy, in, you know, we're going to involve a third guy in a two-man action, and then you'd scramble out of it. And the intuitiveness with which you guys scrambled out yeah. – when there was that three on two or that four on three on the backside, that to me is what made that team elite. 
Yeah, I think the scramble. I think the scramble was a special part. And, like, it was more so, like, because there's a flow and there's just rotations in the NBA that you will know until you're old as dirt. You know what I mean? That just when you go this way, this guy's going to exile. You hit this guy, he's going to run. Like, And we just kind of shifted it to say, okay, because every team practices against that. So when you come off and you know the big's going to jump it, you're going to hit Joe right over the top, and then he can hit the cutter. But, no, we're going to blitz you and we're going to take Joe away. So make JJ throw it all the way across the court, if you know, and if he does that, God bless him. And the guy that's running over there, maybe to Ennis or Jimmy, oh yeah, that's gonna be Kawhi or Pascal or whoever, you know what I mean, to catch the catch the next play. And that was kind of like the specialness of it. And now it's you know every team's doing it, you know what I mean? It's like finding success in the scramble and just trying to keep offenses off balance and keep them guessing. That's that's kind of you guys actually brought this up separately because Tommy brought up the parody thing and uh, you brought up the 19 championship mm -hmm. team which I think has contributed to this era that we're in right now but if you look at the last four years I mean we've got Ra Raptors Lakers Bucks Golden State for the fifth straight year it feels like anyone can win this thing and during that heat run or even mm -hmm. the Cleveland Golden State run there were so many complaints yeah why? Why is there a regular season? Why yeah. are they even playing the playoffs? Yeah. We know who. We yeah. know who's going to be in the finals. Right. It's like, I mean, I think what's going on right now is so good for the game and the sport. Yeah, no doubt, it's fun to watch, and I think that was the NBA's design, right? I mean, with some of the CBA stuff, allow other markets to compete, and what you can pay a guy, and going into the tax, and all, I think it was by design was to have more parity and to have at least feel like anybody can win, and it definitely seems that way now. Like there's not really any juggernaut teams, you know what I mean? Like there's there's a maybe four great teams that's great consistently throughout the the, the season, and everybody else is kind of riding a wave up and down, and you know playoffs is you get a matchup that you like or don't like, and uh, injury or way like it could go either way so it's definitely uh a lot more even at, at, in feel we'll see what it looks like at the end but right now it feels that way well i was gonna i was gonna ask about you know you guys in particular this year but then the other sort of comp i wanted to make to this was brooklyn and this yeah. one that they're on and how yeah. if you ask those guys and we sort of did you know in november where they were with everything i don't think their answers would be very positive and right. now you look where they are and they're you know are arguably a a a contender, you know, to be a front runner for the championship. I said it yesterday, man. They're he fucking did. tier he one. Did. They're, they're tier, tier one. one. They're right. tier one. And tier so, one. and so, I think when you when you look at you know where you guys are right now, but I just think in general, does it also feel like it is more than usual? Like, oh, if we can just you know flip the switch a little bit and just run off five or six in a row, then yeah. we're back in it in a way that you know we may not have been in another yeah. season. I mean, shit, you a six game win streak from being in the top three or top four. Like, yeah. it's, it sucks. Honestly, because it's like you always got that in your back of your head. But also with the, you know, two things that I don't want to forget is going to 10 for the play in changes the seven to 11 spot. Right. So if you're in, what are we, maybe 11 or 12, we might be three games back from six and five games back from fucking the last place in the conference. Potentially Wembenyama. Right. So now it's like that's a whole another dynamic. And two, about Brooklyn, uh, so we played them early and we played them um, recently. The game has changed completely to where it's not the juggernaut, where it's like just come up, Brown's going to ISO you to death, uh, Kyrie's going to ISO you to death, uh, whatever. Like the great teams in the league are playing great fucking team basketball. And that's the biggest difference that I've seen, especially this year, because we played Brooklyn when they looked like they didn't want to be there and they hated each other. And Steve was there and you could tell it was, you know, messed up. And then we played them recently where it was just like they're on a rhythm and they're on a, a clock and everybody's bought in and everything's flowing the right way. I think those are the, the best teams that are bought in completely to everything they got going on. I like the word friction. There yeah. was friction. In a lot of friction. There, <laughs> there was, was a lot friction. of friction and dysfunction. And um, <laughs> you used to just throw a mask on it and win a couple games and, you know, have some superstars that could bail you out. But with the way the game is going, I think you got to be playing great team basketball to make it through the regular season. I think I think Boston's another great example of that. Absolutely. And they, they started to shift that yeah. last season. Yeah. And that, that's not all on Joe. But Joe is sort of really 
bought into that yeah. idea of player ball movement, not just matchup hunting. Now, obviously in the playoffs, maybe it's a different story. Yeah. But night to night, Jalen's getting 27, Jason's getting 30. Yeah. But like everybody else is still eating. Yeah. The ball moves and they're they're taking threes. Like that, I, I think you're I think you're spot on on that. And yeah. I think some of that too, by the way. Like we hit a weird period that w when James was at his peak, when, mm -hmm. when when Harden was at his peak, where it was like, oh, you got to you, ISO, ISO, yeah. ISO. And yeah. then Luca comes along, it's like ISO, ISO, ISO. Yeah. And 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 now I think that you like there's a little bit of a balance there. Yeah, there's that's, a little balance. It's a lot more balance. Golden State winning it with Steph by himself, you know, changes everything again because you say, okay, it's the ball movement, it's the splits. It's Steph is probably the most guy to get off of it. Um, that that copycat league again. People are gonna try to adjust it. That's harder to guard, and I think it's it makes your defense better when everybody feels involved and engaged, and everybody's eating, and they can accept you know where they fall in the the ranking of the team. You know what I mean? So, uh, but Boston just got there last year. They had the Kemba year. They had the Kyrie year where they had the year where they were trying to figure out who was gonna be, and nobody thought that those two guys could play together and and now you know they're everybody's favorite so it takes some adjusting for sure um we spoke a bunch about stuff that has changed on the court in your seven years what is what has changed the most off the court in the nba the dress code. <laughs> the dress code the dress code i was, I was looking at the yo. game yesterday i'm like rj barrett stopped playing he had some i think it was uh I think it was fear of God, but he had Yo. some, or probably might've been Adidas, too, Bro, it's, it's, deal. but he had some sweatsuit on and I was like, man, I had to wear a fucking suit. Suit and tie. Suit and tie every single suit time. Suit and tie, the dress code, uh, the money. I mean, it's just more, you know what I mean? So it's guys that might not even be playing or coming off the bench that's making 10. The rookies coming in and the first lottery pick, they making 10, 12 a year. It's just, you know, it's just different. Like everything is it's just different. There's more personnel. There's more staff. There's more everything. Like we travel heavy. We got people. I don't even know what their jobs are. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just growing. It's just growing so fast. And I'm only, you know, on my seventh year, and I've seen such a change in such a small time. So the dress code is the first thing that comes to mind because I, I look at some of the stuff these guys wear to the games, and it's just. I can't believe it because I still had to get dressed. You know, my first year. I think we got it. Well, COVID sort of was the the factor in yeah. ixnaying the the suits on the bench but the credit really should go to russ because he just yeah, kept yeah, pushing yeah, the envelope yeah, yeah. kept pushing the envelope yeah because now it's like what is fashion how can you tell me <laughs> you know what's what like what are you how can you tell me what is acceptable for me to wear as fashion now you just say it's fashion if i want to wear my shirt out if i want to wear no shirt with a like a jacket over and wear my chest out i mean it's fashion it does it does make sense that when you think about just like, you know, how how big NBA players are off the court compared to every other sport, this we're never there's never a camera shot of a quarterback who's not playing. I mean, maybe once if he's yelling at someone or something like that, but for the most part, <laughs> it's like if you're not playing in another sport, you're not there. You're yeah. Not a part of it. Versus if like Russ isn't playing or Braun isn't playing or something like that, the yeah. camera's still on them all the time. Yeah. They're there, they're there. No, the marketability is crazy in yeah. the NBA, you know, especially if you're one of the premier guys. Like that's what people pay to see. And, you know, now with the way that, you know, guys don't play <laughs> some <Yeah>. nights, you know, <laughs> tomorrow is a TV game. If somebody's not playing, they might have a 30 second shot of just that guy sitting on the bench. So Whatever he's got on, you got to bear witness to it. You know what I mean? I think that's part of it. You know, I just realized, uh, Jason will agree with me on this. Tommy sometimes pushes the envelope a little bit with his fashion choices. <laughs> the wardrobe? Well, J I mean, JJ you, does not you like You wore a pajama my... top to like three of our interviews, <laughs> which is fine. I'm not, I've never said anything, first but of all, I do believe. Nice, first of all, it was a nice shirt. It was a Todd Snyder shirt. Secondly, I just, it was just bad luck because we taped three interviews on the same day. Yeah. And then we put them all out back to back to back. And so everybody thought, was like, thought you were the he, same only wears, he only owns one shirt. You only got one. We got to get and him a pajama wardrobe. top. And you got to put him get wardrobe in the budget, boy, man. Well, 100%. <laughs> also, he was smart that he brought a change of clothes and he didn't tell him. He wasn't yeah. like, oh, by the way, maybe you should bring a different shirt. Yeah. He just let me get roasted. Yeah. Because he knew he's, it, honestly, it was, this was like a setup. He set you up. Yeah. He thought, you know what I mean? Did this it is, help? Did it change anything? A little bit. All right. This is bit. the first time I just, I'm looking, I don't, sorry that we're doing this in front of you, Fred, but 
is the first time that I think Tommy and I've ever dressed basically the same. Joggers, yeah. sneakers, a hoodie. This I don't is think the first. I don't think it's the first time. <laughs> Take the 140 episodes. <laughs> hey, Tommy, so, tell him to put wardrobe we in need the budget, a, we man. We need Ryan Cohen or some we one of our... Stylist. We need Fred to send this <laughs> yeah, merch. I'll and send we'll you just, some. And then we'll just wear this. I'll send you some. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, Fred, I want to I want to talk about your play right now. Yeah. Because going back to the end of last season when you had a couple injuries, um, your your shooting numbers tailed off a little bit. Obviously, you know, you were in the conversation for all NBA last year. Um, and then to start this year, you've you've dealt with some stuff. You're coming off a back injury where you you were out a couple games. And I, I read an interview where you said at this point it's all mental. Like the shooting thing is all mental. Um from someone who who dealt with different injuries at time though it's very hard as some you know you're on the move you're shooting off the dribble you're shooting off pin downs whatever it may be it's very hard to not compensate when your body's not right how much have the injuries affected your shooting uh probably a lot you know what i mean and i got to be careful with what i say sometimes and you know it's a, it's a lot going on and um just being in the business of it i've learned how to try to you know, manipulate as best I can. I think that um, early on in the season, it was definitely a adjustment. I think um, from a stylistic point, the way we were playing um, last year was just kind of free and easy. And I think I was much more a focal point with just on ball duties and having the ball the whole game and being able to kind of dictate where I wanted to go. And this year that's changed a little bit. Um, so I'm kind of just like, you know, catching the rhythm. So you know how it goes some nights, the ball finds you some nights it doesn't. And the nights where it doesn't, those are the nights that I'm struggling this year, where it's like the outer rhythm games where I may get a couple catching shoes, couple contested ones, couple ones off the dribble, not getting to the foul line. And then, you know, I get three wide open ones at the end of the night when we need them. And if I make them, we win. If I miss them, we lose. I've had probably like four or five of those games. So I think it's a big drop off from like where I was as far as an all star caliber point guard to where I am now. But I think it's pretty situational, too, in terms of where we are as a team and as an organization trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to maximize the most out of this team. And I got a lot of other responsibilities other than just like scoring the ball. So I'm doing a lot and that shooting has been up and it's been down way more than I would like it to be. So uh, I'm giving myself a little runway, but at the same time, um, just being realistic about where we are. And when I really, really feel like shit, I just go watch the film and say, okay, well, I was two for 12 from three and eight of them were bombs and three of them were heavily contested by a seven footer. And I missed three wide open ones, you know, in my 39th minute of the night. So it's like you got to be able to be fair with yourself too, but come in and just put the work in too. I, I always, I've used this quote many times on this podcast and I always go back back to it. Roy, Roy McIlroy, I don't, you're a golf fan? Yeah. You know who Roy is, yeah, I, yeah. I hope. Um, but he said, when you're playing bad, you feel so far away. And when you're playing good, you always think to yourself, how did I feel like I was so far away? And it's interesting that you you said that. Yeah, about going back and watching the film and actually dissecting what your shots were because I would do that as well. Yeah, you know, I didn't have as many responsibilities. You basically, I was there to shoot the basketball, right. and then later on in my career, I was a screener. Yeah, um, <laughs> but right. uh, I would go back and I would be like, "All right, what's the perspective here? Like, give me something." And mm -hmm. you're, you're right. Sometimes it's end of a shot clock. Sometimes it's an out of rhythm shot. Sometimes it's a ridiculous heat check. Sometimes yeah. it's maybe. Uh, you, you force like I, I remember in that Toronto series yeah. against y'all. Yeah. Brett never talked anything to talk, never never talked to me about bad shots. He was mm -hmm. like, "Play free, yeah. take your shots." There was twice in that series where he was like, "We can get you a better shot. <laughs> Don't take that shot." Right for sure because they count. You know what I mean? They count and like the same aggressiveness that makes you great can hurt you sometimes, especially when you're searching for them. And um, I think that's something that has played a role too is like the same confidence and swagger that I play with to make any shot at any time over anybody. I think that when it's not going good, you know, the pile up can can kind of happen fast. So I mean, listen, the same I'm the same guy that can give you 30 on any, any given night or 39 on back to back games against the best or whatever. But there's been way more bad games than I'm accustomed to having for my standard. 
and a down year for me is 18 and six, you know, and uh, off the ball roll, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to figure it Fred, out and find my way. You don't need to justify yourself to me, man. Yeah, I, no, I'm not justifying. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying like this, this, this is where I'm at. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And uh, last night was one of those nights. So you're getting some of those feelings today as well. Uh, but more than anything, because I genuinely really don't give a fuck is that we're losing. So it's just a whole nother aspect of like, I've pride myself on being a winning player and I won a championship. I won my whole life. I've never been on a bad team and we're losing on top of me not having my greatest year after having a great year. So it's, it's tough right now in January 3rd or whatever it is. I was going to actually talk about this in another part, but I'm curious about your perspective on it now. You know, last time you were on, we talked a lot about the chip on your shoulder with your just everything from Rockford to Wichita and the not being drafted, everything like that. But you know, since, even since the last time you were on the show, it's like you made an All Star team. You've had mm-hmm. you've you've had these NBA champ. You've had you've had these incredible moments in your career. And I was going to ask you about how you keep the chip on your shoulder after accomplishing all of this. But even listening to you now, it does sound a little bit like the competitiveness and the anger of all of these different things will keep that drive coming you can make 10 all-star teams yeah. and you'll still have it when you go on a stretch like this do you feel like that's just the case in terms of how you sort of are wired yeah i just i'm just never satisfied you know because i expect so much from myself and i know what i what i'm capable of and then i'll show you what i'm capable of and then you know it'll be like everything i do has to be 10 times better than the next person just because of where i come from and like my story to get here you know what i'm saying so i gotta be 10 times better than the next guy. And so it always keeps me going. And I'm also like extremely critical of myself as well. So, you know, I don't really give myself credit for the good games because I expect to do that. And I just have really high expectations. So that that keeps me going and um, just keeps me working and everything else will will fall where it is. But uh, that's something that like last year, I remember as soon as I made the All-Star game, I was like, all right, like, this is not a fluke you know what I'm saying and I already went into that mode right away and I got hurt for the last half of the season but that was like a shift right away we spent a ton of time two two and two years ago and change when you were on the show uh on your backstory but that all-star nod what did that mean what were the moment what were the moments like when you first found out yeah I mean we played I think we played that night when they, when they um announced it so just the anxiety of like knowing that I did enough to be selected but like tricking myself out of it like man they gonna hate on me I know they not gonna pick me man like this always happens like my whole life has been happening so for that to finally you know make the nod and the, to get picked it was just a big relief and um just a big uh I could just take a breath for a second and just appreciate you know how far I've come knowing where I came into and knowing where being undrafted slots you in the business or even just the depth chart, just sticking to basketball, where that puts you at. Um, Knowing what I was up against to do all of that in six years, you know what I'm saying? I was just proud of myself and the people that supported me along the way. It was a great moment for us. We should mention Fred is the fourth undrafted player in the modern NBA to earn an all-star nod. Ben Wallace has the most of any undrafted player, I believe. Connie Hawkins was also undrafted, but that was uh, a while ago. So there's actually five guys ever to be undrafted and be all-stars. And I I told this story the first time that Fred was on the show, but I want to tell it again. I think it was my first year in Philly, Fred's second year in the league, and I came up to you at the scorer's table. um, And I was like, dude, I was like, I know this sounds weird, but you're one of my favorite players in the league. (laughs) And you're like, oh, thanks, man. And yeah. And, uh, you know, f- for all the reasons you're describing, regardless of how you play, uh, you know, in terms of shooting or passing or guarding, it's like I I, I saw that you had this, like, chip and, yeah. and you played hard and you were yeah. about the right things. And and if, Tommy, if you had told me six le- years later that we'd be sitting here and we, he would have an all-star nod and he'd be wearing his own merch, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> so he has a ring? He has a ring? Yeah. He's an all-star? Nah, listen, man. Shit, shit, God is good, man. That's all I can say. I, I appreciated that, though, at the time, too. Like, And I try to do a little bit more of that as I get more years in. But it was just funny because JJ is such a dick, bro. Like, He's just such a dick to play against. And like, 
This is fucking, what we keep trying to fucking, emphasize on the show is fucking, that he's a dick. <laughs> oh man, he's a fucking menace out there, bro. The elbows and dirty and shit. He just he's just a feisty. Right. So for him to say that, like at the it was crazy because I had to guard him. So we probably I probably was matching his minutes at the time. Like I remember that, like, you gotta guard JJ. I'm like, all right, fuck. So he's like, Yeah, he's one of my favorite players. And I'm like, is he trying to keep me? He's, he's trying to butter me up. <laughs> and then great. I went back out there. He's like, boom, like elbow to the chest. He run off a pin down. Like, all right, I got him. I got him. I meant it sincerely. Didn't mean I didn't want to yeah, kick yeah. your ass. Yeah, that yeah, night. yeah. You know, I appreciate it, man. That's the best. That's the best. How how do you sort of explain the the struggles you guys have right now? I mean, <clears throat> Tommy and I during uh, last season spoke about our love for you guys multiple times. Uh, the playoff series with the Seventy Sixers was very competitive yeah. in the first round last year, and I think the expectation. Uh, we, you know, we talked about it preseason. Like the expectation would you, you guys at this point in the season would be in the mix. You'd be a top six team in the East. Um, and some of it is the depth of the league and whatnot. But yeah. just the, the struggles, it seems like the team is off from yeah. an outsider's perspective. Yeah, I just think we haven't been able to find much consistency. And, um, you know, that comes from a lot of different places, whether it's injuries or whatever the case may be. But we just haven't been able to be consistently good. And and we have flashes and maybe it's 32 minutes out of a 48 minute game. But like, like you said, the rest of the league is continuing to get better and it's more spread out. And there's, you know, 10 other good teams in the East and, you know, 10 other good teams in the West. And um, we just haven't been able to put it together. So we just got to keep growing and, you know, find ways to like reinvent ourselves. I think we're still trying to find a, a new identity and we had one last year which was you know play hard and cause havoc and all of those things but it just hasn't been that for us this year um also being patient because we really got hot towards the end as well so like a lot of what we do is is rhythm and flow and just cohesiveness that we haven't had and i think that when it's clicking it's really good and it's hard to play against and um when it's not our margin for error is really small so um, we're playing you know, five guys, you know, heavy minutes. So you know, it's up and down and just got to adjust to our play style. Um, last year was a little more evenly distributed. This year, Pascal's taking more of like a offensive engine role where he's having astronomical numbers. Um, and we're finding, trying to find ways to be successful in that. But our defense has just been shit so far. And um, we got to find ways to to be better with that. I was going to ask about, you know, Pascal is a guy who's made it all all NBA team twice, you know, so he's not new to this. But this year, it does feel like he has taken a jump. His numbers yeah. twenty six, eight, and seven right now. He obviously yeah. had the crazy MSG game. What is about him this season when he's hurt for a little bit? What what is it about him this season when he's been playing that's been so special? Uh, he's shooting jumpers. He's just shooting jumpers. Really, like everything else is similar. You know, the passing, getting in the paint, and kicking his reads are getting better, but for him to even have the footwork for a one-two pull-up or a fadeaway spin over the left shoulder, right shoulder, whatever, like he's his his jump shooting and his attack to the game adds another dimension for him and for our team and um, it's just making him pretty much unguardable. And again, maybe it's the analytics, but he's not facing as many double teams because he's not down there with his back to the basket. And so when he's out in front, it's hard to run at him. And so he's getting more to the mid range. He's getting he's stopping a little bit shorter, and his his touch around the rim has been great. So he's he's playing at a super high level. Uh, Tommy's on record, by the way. This was two weeks ago. as saying Pascal is not going to be an all star this year. I argued vehemently yeah. that Pascal should be. Um, yeah. But that's Tommy. You know, I fucking said crazy. Mr. Negative. I said it. I love. I just. Whatever. How is twenty six, eight, and seven not an all star, bro? I said. Oh, I said two things. I said we were we were getting into we were getting into this discussion, and I was like, I don't know whether he's going to be on the team because I don't know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? There could be a trade. There could be something like that. So I said that's a possibility that he could be moved. Secondly, we were so talking, if he goes to the West, but, he's not an all star. He wouldn't become an all star. Still, what has it? What does that have to do with anything? Would you would you become an all star based off of those numbers? In like, say he was traded to Portland hypothetically, would he be an all star in the West based on his Eastern Conference numbers? I don't know the rules on that. Yeah, who's the forwards would. over there? I mean, he's definitely an all. He's definitely he's an all NBA player right now. I think yeah. that's not up for debate. 
So he's not so all NBA, but he's not. I'm all-star. saying I said there's a possibility he might not be an All Star. And JJ got talk to me. I want to hear. It. Okay, that was the first reason. What's the other? No, reason? No, here's, here's hold on. I had another reason. No, the other the other reason is we were going over we were going over the we were going over the entire roster, and I was basically like I'm weighing it based off of of wins and off of record, and I was like at that point you guys were 11 or 12 in the East, and I was like if I'm going to pick an All Star, it's going to be it was a I think it was a choice between him. Jalen and Tyrese Halliburton. No, no, yes. Tommy, Tommy. Yes. No, and I was like, no. And I, was, I said and I was there ba- were eight locks in the East, and Pascal was one of them. And you said, "Why is why would Pascal be an All Star?" That I didn't say why would he be an All Star. I said, "Why is he started. a lock?" I say, "Why is he a lock?" Because his number. But there have been a ton of examples of guys who've put up amazing numbers who haven't made. Zach Levine was like this. He didn't make the team. Put up amazing numbers. Uh, now I'm not comparing the two of them. Yeah, at I was all. gonna say, yeah, I'm, not comparing, now. I'm not comparing the two. I'm not comparing the two of them all. But I said just because you have the numbers, it is also about wins. And I think that that I think it's convenient. Like it's about wins when it's convenient for your argument. You know what I'm saying? Because when you like a guy, you'll find ways to to make it happen. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like is Shea is Shea an all star? Yes. Yeah. See. That is, hypocrisy. There is that is that is that is hypocritical. I agree. Okay, I agree. there we go. Argument. I over. actually, I would argue this. This I didn't mean to get off topic. I didn't know this was going to go this way, yeah. but I like that Fred's sticking up for his teammate here. I would argue All Star should be about the twenty four best. I would actually argue there should be thirty All Stars. There should be fifteen in each conference. Why we're still using twenty four, which is what we started with when there were eight fucking teams and twenty five percent of the league got in. The, it doesn't even make sense. Right. Like, let's. Let's give an opportunity to six more guys. I think that. Um, but I think All-Star should just be, in general, like the best players should get in every year. Yeah. That's the, you're an All-Star. Like yeah. when we get into all NBA discussion, I think there's a little more nuance there. When you get to the 11th or 12th guy, Tommy, and you're weighing similar stats, similar analytics, like, yeah, we can start talking about wins. But like, I think with All-Star, we, I want to see the best players in the All-Star I have game. a question for you because we always talk about this with MVP. I wait the winning in the MVP as a more important metric than numbers. And this yeah, was always the context of the winning matters. The context of the winning. If you if you have a loaded team and you say, all right, the best player, this is why Jordan, Who's your this MVP is why this Jordan year? didn't win right now. Every my year. MVP LeBron right, didn't win every my year. MVP right now is probably Jokic, but Luca, it's it's him and Luca are one and one A to me. But I think, I think, but the question with this was, I don't, I wouldn't have voted for Jokic's MVP when they were the seventh best team in the West. I don't care what his numbers are, is sixth, what I'm saying. And now sixth, they're not. Now they're the best team sixth, in the West, six best team in the West. Year. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, I just think we overestimate. It's almost getting to like football standards now, where it's like you overestimate the value of one guy. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's so much more than that now because you damn near need ten. You definitely need eight or nine, but you almost need 10 solid players to be a good team. And I think that there is some arguments that need to be made because if you give a great player um, 150 possessions a game, he's going to average 27, eight and nine. You know what I'm saying? I think there is something there. But for the most part, I mean, you just got to trust your eyes. Like who has the most impact for what they're working with and how that translate to winning which is weird because is is it a regular season thing or is it a, a a whole playoff thing i think that's another dynamic as well yeah because it's two different games like is kevin Dur- is kevin durant not a, not an mvp this year he's in it he's probably number three or right four. and then now you get and see and now you get that held against you that you're kd and you know what I mean? You're looking at it as somebody that, oh, he's supposed to do that. You know what I'm saying? I think yeah. he should be in the MVP discussion. Like, I don't know. It's it's tough. All-star should just be who's playing the best up until February 12th or whatever, who's having the best season in this moment. And you can say, oh, this guy's winning or he's not winning. So by that argument, if you have another all-star on your team, that change, how does that change it? Yeah, it hurts you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's weird. <laughs> <That's, Yeah. laughs> well, it's it's hard too because the All Star game, I believe, is like two weeks after they name the All Star team, right? And it's whatever two months, two and a half months uh, prior to the end of the regular season, so it's not even necessarily a complete picture. This is yeah. this is why All NBA, I think, is more. It, yeah. Let's let's just put the best players. Whoever playing the best in the NBA, let's put them in the All Star game. 
Let's but put you them still in the got a fan I know vote. Gonna, you got a fan vote. You got all type of stuff you got to work on. What's going to happen is you guys are going to you guys are going to whip off like nine in a row. Yeah. Pascal is going to average 30. <laughs> and this is going to get fucking, you're going to fucking yeah, bring it He's going to be an MVP, MVP <laughs> candidate. <laughs> I know this is going to happen. He's an MVP I candidate. We're like, <laughs> yo, Tommy said, yeah, this is Tommy, already first yeah. week in January. It's going to take four years yeah. to live it down. I'm on your We're ass, Tommy. Another podcast I'm on your ass, Tommy. And he's going to bring it up too. And I just feel yeah. you know what, like, just sometimes. Uh, hey, we can use anything <laughs> right now. Opinion. We're going to use you. We're going to use you to turn our season This is why around. I like asking questions. I don't like giving opinions. It's because mm-hmm. of this exact reason. Mm-hmm. So, I yeah. have a question about oh, this. I, have, I haven't noticed that, Tommy, when yeah. I ask you questions, how you just ask a question. I, just, yeah. I, just ask back. <laughs> Who, I wanted, we were talking about this before you got here. If you were to do a, a bet on yourself, all star starting five, now all, all, it can be all time. It doesn't have to be current guys. Do you have a, a list? You can't pick yourself. I can't pick myself, but yeah. so all time five. I mean, undrafted guys for sure. I think got to I mean, you got to give Ben Wallace some credit. You got to give uh, John Starks. You got to give guys like that. And then I'm a I'm a little guy, so both Isaiah's AI. This is some of my favorite guys. And another guy who's climbing up my list of one of my favorites is uh, Jose Alvarado. So yeah, he's gonna ask he, one. He's been yeah. that's a good one. He's been balling, man. It's this has been fun to watch him and like just knowing what you're up against. And I don't I mean, I don't hold it against the guys that are like put in positions and everything's built around them to win. I just give more credit to somebody who has to fight against more to to make it happen. Have you gotten a chance? We had him on the show back in May. Have you gotten a chance to, to spend any time with him? Yeah. So we uh we connected um I met him for the first time. He did his pre-draft for Toronto when I met him. And so we connected him. We text now and again, and then we spent some time together in New Orleans. So I'm just sharing, you know, what I went through with him and see how his career is going to um, go. But uh, I love watching those guys that, that are trying to just make something out of nothing. I bring up my kids all the time now on the podcast because they're so into basketball. But this is this is like a twice or three time a month conversation that I have with my oldest son about guys like Jose or TJ because mm-hmm. his question with every player, it's so, it's just a simple question. It's like, is he good? And I'm like, yeah, dude, he's in the NBA. He's yeah. good. Well, how good? <laughs> and I, I'm, I try to tell him like every team, every single team would love to have Jose Alvarado on their team. I was TJ's teammate for two years. If I ever, if I ever ran a team or coached a team, like I want a TJ McConnell yes. on my team. I'd love to have yes. two. Yes. I don't know that there's two out there. Yeah, there's no. not there's not a no. lot of guys like that yeah. that are just so team first, so yeah. disruptive. Like Jose, to his credit, man, too, like he can shoot. Yeah. You know, TJ never yeah. decided he didn't yeah. want to shoot a three. Ever, yeah, but yeah. T- I Jose think TJ shoot. said, fuck it. <laughs> 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 he found success. But uh, yeah, man, I think like what's your value? You know what I'm saying? I think you just got to find like more ways to create value. And again, as an undrafted guy or somebody who has to kind of figure it out, you got to get even more creative and find other things. So you might just be an energy guy. You might be a, a high fiver or you might be a hype man or whatever the case may be. And then you get out there and you got to, but to be able to change an NBA game, I think that puts you high on, on my list. Like I don't care about talent, skill, whatever, to be able to check into the game off the bench, cold and change the entire flow and feel to the game. And I think that's a, that's a very valuable skill to have. This is why we got to give players time. This is why I ha- I don't like ever like putting a player in a box. I played against you and Pascal yeah. when you guys were on the bench yeah. in Toronto. And some games you'd play 15 minutes, some games yeah. you'd play eight. Some game like you figured out a way defensively to stay on the court. Yeah. Pascal was like I was like what is his game? Yeah, what is, what is his yeah. game? This is <laughs> this is bizarre yeah. how he plays. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and it's like if guys that are wired a certain way, they they carve out value, they 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 get better year to year. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, Pascal's all NBA. Oh, mm. Fred's an all-star. You like, talked about that with Draymond too. Yeah. You know, how Draymond changed how he how his game basically changed from when you first played against him in the league till obviously, you know, where he is now. Yeah. I just I just think it's so important as a player. Yeah. And and even young players, if they listen to this, yeah, no how doubt. important is like Hey, it's not where you are right now. 
it's where you want to be in five years. You got to just create value year after year after year. You got to figure it out, bro. Like that's just, you just got to figure it out and you got to just be crazy about it and just like not let anybody talk you out of it or trick you out of your position and just say this is where I know I can get to. Like I know it. It's a feeling that I have. I know what I can do. And how do I get there? It might not be right to the Pascal wasn't an offensive engine his first year in the NBA. You know, I remember he would play the first five minutes of the game and not play. Like he would start play five minutes of the first and then he wouldn't play the rest of the game. Like they were when he got the ball, they were screaming, move it. You know what I mean? Like pass it, like don't dribble it. You know what I mean? And now he's we run an entire offense through him. So it's you gotta have like more confidence in your makeup and your character and just your work ethic, I think, to continue to try to evolve and get better. I was going to say, and I, we talked about this um, last time you were on, but another guy who's like, this is a guy we have on the show a lot, Alex Caruso. Yeah. A little, little different. I like you know, game-wise like that. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm curious about like, I don't know whether the word is street smarts or instinct or whatever it is, but you're, when you're talking about like having a, it's like a self-awareness of yeah. how to change a game and what you have to do to change a game, which is not necessarily how you've been, because everybody can score, everybody yeah. can do everything. You're in the NBA. Is that something that is that something that can be taught, or is it just a thing where you kind of just have it or you don't? Yeah, I think it's a tangible thing, like an intangible thing. I don't think you can teach that because it's more of like your makeup as a person to be able to. Because it's one thing to be confident to say, okay, this guy's confident; he's a bucket; he can give me twenty. And there's another type of confidence that's just like, I don't give a fuck if I score. I'm going to help my team win this game. I'm going to set a screen for JJ. I'm going to dive on the floor. I'm going to guard the best player. I'm going to do all the things. Like, there's so many different ways to impact the game. And I think finding that is like the magic of becoming a, a impact player, a guy that every team will want to have. And that's ultimately where the value is. You know what I mean? You want to impact winning and you want to get paid. And most of the time, those two things go hand to hand. And there's special slots for guys throughout the league that's made for the the aliens you know what i mean yeah. that's what i call them like there's yeah. a lot of aliens in the nba and then there's guys who gotta figure it out yeah there's the, there's the the tier one and year to year there's maybe like five guys yeah. six guys i feel like there's more the last two years to be honest yeah. with you that feel tier one to me and tier two is like probably another 20 players and then the tier three which is guys that are like borderline all-stars there's probably yeah. like 50 to 70 of those guys there's right situation right fit like they they could be stars in their own way but tommy your point we <clears throat> something i say all the time man you gotta star in your role you gotta yeah. star in your role Shit, you know no what doubt. it is too fred there's a lot of to your point about the intangible i agree with your your answer to, to tommy's question because there's a lot of guys that i played against that i played with um that were more talented than me and certainly were more talented than some of my teammates, but didn't last Yeah, because they weren't willing to sacrifice. They weren't yeah. willing to do things differently. I did this in college or I did this this way. And it's like, this is not going to work here, but yeah, no, I saw a good tweet about it the other day. It's like, if you, if you can only do one thing, like if all you can do is score, like you're a bad basketball player. Just like if you only had an A plus in math, but you got bad grades and every other thing, like your GPA is going to be low. It's like, what else do you do that impacts the game and winning? And if you only do one thing, you have to do it at such a high level that it, it balances everything out. And then you're just in a specialist role. But even as somebody who's considered a specialist, you are a good team defender. You know what I mean? You you are a good teammate. You are a willing passer when it mattered, like you still had to know how to play and you were a fucking one of the all time scorers in college before that transition into like a specialist role. You know what I'm saying? That's the other part too, is like, you gotta be able to adapt. You said in your last couple of years, you were a screener. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy <laughs> to think about that. Like where you started from and where you ended and just being able to stay alive and I think even as a teenager, my goal was like, how do I get to 10 years? Like, how do I get to 10 years? And then, okay, how do I get to 15? How do I maintain longevity? And I think most of that is like taking care of your body and all of that shit, but like being able to adapt and adjust to have more value in other places. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, Fred, this has been a great conversation. We appreciate yeah. the hour of your time and uh, wish you all the best the rest of the year, man. Sir, appreciate Thanks, you guys. Thank you.